Good evening, everyone. We continue on our study in the book of First Kings, and we are here in verse 26. In this new segment, we begin with uh, then. Uh, this is talking about a new segment, not a continuation of the one before. So it's not then as in and then, but it's then it is an after. Right? After that. After that. Now we have a new personality introduced uh, in the form of Yerav, Yerav Am. At least that's how it's pronounced. Uh, Yerav Am. Right here. Yerav Am, the son of Navat. Uh, an Ephraimite is from Ephraim uh, of Zereda. He is Solomon's servant. That's Jeroboam, uh, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, meaning without a man, who also rebelled against the king. So a couple of things that we need to remember here is uh, Jeroboam is the principal individual that we are now paying attention to. He is from the northern tribes and is tribe of Ephraim. And then he rebelled against the king. Now this is interesting. Uh, the word rebelled against the king is not our regular phrase. Uh, I guess you can say that you can say that it is to cause, cause his hand to be high. That that is the that's a Hebrew term. Cause his hand to be high against the king, and this would be something akin to a public rebuke. Now, obviously, we need to know that Solomon is king and he's king over all. And for a servant of Solomon who dares speak out against the king in public is very daring indeed. And what did he speak against the king? And we're talking about Solomon here. What did he do that made Jeroboam very angry? And then he says that, this is the matter. Why he caused his hand to be high against the king. So remember this one, rebel, has the same meaning. right? Caused his hand to be high against the king. And the reason being is that the king, Solomon, built the Milo and closed up the breach of the city of his father, David. Now understand this, the breach, the breach here literally means the bricks. So if you were to imagine that we have City of David, the Milo, and the Temple Mount, right? This is what we would see. So we have the City of David. And then we have the Milo, and then we have the temple. Now, what happened was that there is a wall here, right? The wall is here. Now, at the days of David, there were breaches. Breaches means there were bricks in the wall. So the wall has bricks. What does that mean? It means that when people, people can walk in to the temple. Now, what happened when Solomon took over is that he actually closed up the breaches. The reason why he closed up the breaches is because he built the temple for the Egyptian princess. 
in the Milo area. And so it would be intruding into a private princess area, if you want to call it that way. And so Jeroboam was angry. And so he raised his hand. He made a public rebuke. Why did you stop the approaches to the temple when your father David had done that kind of a thing? And now the man Jeroboam was a valiant warrior. And so as a servant of Solomon, he is brilliant in his warfare. And when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, now this word industrious in verse 28 means that he is a diligent worker. A diligent worker. He works hard, right? He works hard. And then he was appointed over all the, well, you can say here, all the burdens of the house of Joseph. This is the burdens. The load, right? The load. Now, the reason why he was given the house of Joseph in this case is because he's from Ephraim. So he's from Ephraim. And these are all the northern tribes. And since it says here the house of Joseph, we can also safely assume that Manasseh is also included. Right? So for both uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. So house of Joseph should include both Ephraim and Manasseh. And so he was well trusted by King Solomon. So even though there was a public rebuke, there was no animosity between the king and Jeroboam. In verse 29, now comes God's message to uh, Jeroboam or Jeroboam. And so it says here, and then, and then, this is after the appointment, and then it follows. It came about at a time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahia, now the prophet Ahia is right here, Ahia. The Shilonite found him on the road. Now, Ahia had clothed himself with a new cloak, and both of them were alone in the field. Now, understand, a new garment here, this is Ahia, understand this. Ahia had a new garment. And what is the significance? Not readily recognizable. That's basically what it says. And then he was walking out of Jerusalem. Now, which direction he went, we are not told. Right? Perhaps he would have gone up north since he was in charge of the house of Joseph. And so let's say that he went up north and he came by Jeroboam, and both of them were alone in the field. This may not be Ahia. Although the King James say it's Ahia, uh, this word here literally means he. And so it's a pronoun. With this being a pronoun, uh, you could say that this he might be him. And this him and uh, what he both shares the same reference and this would be Jeroboam. 
instead of Ahia. The King James, this is the new King James, says it's Ahia, but the Hebrew says it's He. And it is better to look at the context that this is not Ahia, and it would be Yeroboam who wore a new cloak or a new garment, not readily recognizable, but there is a second purpose for it. Being new, it is not easily terrible because it's new. And the next part here in verse 30, it says, then it will be, and then, as part of this whole passage, Ahia took hold of the new cloak. And so this is Jeroboam's new cloak, which was on him. And this would be Jeroboam. And he tore it into 12 pieces. So you think of it this way. We have Ahia. And then we have Jeroboam. And Jeroboam was wearing a cloak. And he tore this into 12 pieces. Now, the number 12 is very important in the Bible. And it's always referring to the 12 tribes. The 12 tribes. And so Ahia took hold of the new cloak and Somehow, with some superpower, uh, he managed to tear it into 12 pieces. And this is important as 12 pieces. Verse 31. And then, and then Ahia said to Jeroboam, Take for yourselves 10 pieces, for this is what the Lord. Jehovah, the God of Israel, says, He says, Behold, look, I am going to tear the kingdom away from the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes. And so these twelve pieces can now be divided into ten and then into two. That is the understanding. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I've chosen from all the tribes of Israel. Now, this is interesting because God keeps referring to one. What happened to the other one? Well, the other one being Benjamin is the smallest of all the tribes. So they are more or less absorbed into the tribe of Judah. That would be the understanding here. Now in verse 30, 33, God has an explanation. Why is this done? Because they, Judah, Judah have abandoned me and by implication, Solomon, because he is the king, have abandoned me. Now verse 33, the word, Abandon is to leave. Leave. Uh, it is also to mean, um, how should we say, to forsake. Uh, to neglect. And so this was the time when Solomon himself had approved of Bama or worshipping places or sacrifice places for his wife's gods. And God is very dismayed and very angry because it says, Judah have forsaken me, neglected me. They have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight. 
and keeping my statutes and my ordinances as his father David had done so. So they have not walked, they have not conducted life in the way that God had intended Solomon to do that. How? By doing what is right. Now this word right in verse 33 is yashar, to do what is straight. Don't hide. And it's always in my sight because when God looks at Solomon, he looks at his conduct. And that experience in the conduct is what God will judge whether they are doing straight or not. They are walking the right path or not. Whether they are doing so the same way as David had done. So David is really the benchmark for the first three kings. Saul, very short reign. David, very long reign. And now Solomon has replaced David. And God had expected Solomon to do the same as what David had done. Verse 34, God is now going to explain, Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand. So what is going to happen? He says, I will make him a ruler all, all the days of his life. So that Solomon continues. And this is for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose, who kept my commandments and statutes. My servant David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is to show them what God expects them to do. Look at this. Had Solomon obeyed God, God will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand. In fact, God took everything except for two little pieces. And I will make him a ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant. So what we are told is that the, when, when they came out uh, with, with this worshipping of idols that uh, Solomon had, had built uh, su sacrificed places for his wives and says here, this is basically what you have. You have the goddess of the Sidonians, which is the Asheroth, Chemosh, the god of Moab, Milcom, the god of Ammon. And these were the fortified towns that God had gave earlier to, uh, to the Edomites, to the uh, Moabites, and then to the Ammonites. And when they came together, they had to do what was being set out. God says, I will make him a ruler all the days of his life, meaning Solomon would not be suddenly replaced. That is the underlying tone of the Bible. Now, verse 35 continues on for ver from verse 34. He says, I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give it to you. That is the ten tribes. But to his son, David, to his descendant, I will give him one tribe. Now, understand this one tribe eventually included another tribe of the, 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 the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest of the tribe. So that my servant David may always have a land before me in my Jerusalem. The city where I have chosen for myself to put up my name. Verse 37. However, I will take you and you shall reign over all that you desire and that you shall be king over Israel. So by stating this, God wants humility. You shall reign over all that you desire is power. So we have both power and humility. This is to reign 
And this is to be king, which is also to reign. Right? To reign. And these are two equivalent expressions. So, A and a B. Verse 38. Then it shall be that if you will listen to all that I have commanded you and walk in my ways, and you do what is right in my sight. Now, always in my sight. We seldom see this word, but throughout the book of generations, it's how God looks at his people. Then he will determine how he's going to present himself. And how do you do what is right before God? Keeping my statutes, my commandments, as my servant David did. Then I will be with you. See, all the promises to David is similar to Solomon and now to Jeroboam. And I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David and I will give you Israel. So take a good look at this particular verse. If this is conditional, God is giving him a kingdom. And the first thing that you have in the kingdom, God has his words. You must hear all that I command you. And then this is an A. You can say this. This is an A. This is a B. Walk in my ways. My ways would be what God has instructed. And then a C. Do, listen, walk, and do what is right in my sight, in my eyes, by keeping my statutes and my commandments. Basically, there is an if, conditional. With the conditional, we have the listen to God's word, walk in God's words, and do, as in God's words, by keeping my statute and my commandments, just as David did. So all these is done by David. Solomon was told to do it, and now Jeroboam. Then, a dynasty will ensue, Jeroboam. It will be an enduring house. I built for David, I will give Israel to you, which means that we will be splitting the kingdom into Judah and Israel. Now, in so doing, we can see that God is just. God is just. Why? Just as God had warned David and then in turn warned Solomon, now God warns Jeroboam. Why? Because God's condition for the king is the same. Doesn't matter whether you're with Judah or you're with Ephraim. God expects his people to behave the same way. If you do this, you will be like Judah. You will have a dynasty. How do you find dynasty? You find dynasty when the father perpetuates the son, the son perpetuates the grandson, and that is dynasties. People will remember him by his name. It will be the great work that he has done. And God says, I will build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. So the northern 10 tribes is what is being discussed here. The lower one tribe, and eventually it became with, uh, um, with Benjamin, and it will be fine. So before we leave verse 38, I just want to reiterate. This is God being just. God is just. He says this to Solomon. 
He says this to David. He says this to Saul. And now he says it to Jeroboam. If he listens to God, everything will be fine. Israel is given to Jeroboam, and this will be the northern kingdom. Not the entire 12 tribes. Remember, 10 pieces of the clothing went to Jeroboam. And then God says, so I will oppress the descendants of David for this, but not always. Meaning not for all times, not for all times. There will come a time when the affliction, the humility, to cause to have humility, the descendants of David, this is to teach Judah a major lesson. Now we talk about Judah and it's represented by Solomon. And it's not for all times because there will be a point in time when the Mashiach will return under the descendants of David. And thereby this oppression or humility will come to an end. Will come to an end. In verse 40, we now come to this word. There is the and then, or and, I guess you can say, um, it could be, uh, how should we say? And then would be a possible uh, view of this. And then Solomon sought, therefore, to put Jeroboam to death. The reason being is that this is to seek his death. As a result of Solomon to lose his kingdom, or at least a, a big part of his kingdom, that his descendants will only have a small part of it. Now, he saw this Jeroboam as a threat to the throne. But this threat was set by God, as you can see. And so Jeroboam went and fled to Egypt to Shishak, the king of Egypt. And he was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So this is, in one line, an escape to Egypt, and then he came back to Israel, right? He left to Egypt, and he came back to Israel. Now, this is important because this is at the end days of Solomon. And God was not happy with him. Why did God set all these things in motion? It was because at the very beginning of chapter 11, he loved his wives and he built uh, offering and sacrifice altars for them to go away from God. And in that moment of weakness, or you could call it a senior moment for Solomon, he digressed, he expanded his loyalty from Jehovah to embrace other gods to allow that to coexist, which is not possible in the land of Israel because that's God's land, God's rules. And Solomon violated that principle. And as a result, God had given Ahiah to speak to Jeroboam this particular demise of the rule and authority of Solomon in his kingdom. Now, all of this 
really upset Solomon. Now, instead of Solomon repenting, instead of Solomon looking at himself, he went after Jeroboam, thinking that if Jeroboam had died, this would not happen. Now, we need to always understand that there is a human side to Solomon. Although he had the wisdom, the acute knowledge, he had problems with God. He had problems with obeying what God has told him to do. And yet, as far as God is concerned, God did not end the life of Solomon. Just like God did not end the life of Saul when he went against uh, God's instructions. Uh, when David was anointed, God allowed Saul to persist in his little antics. Now we look at the final two verses of chapter 11. He says, now it's a new segment. The rest of the acts of Solomon uh, in 41, the remainder of the davar, the matters, not necessary acts, right? Uh, you could say the events of Solomon, right? Now the things that happen to Solomon and and this is what whatever means all, all that he did, and about his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon or the words, the Davar of Solomon? And so we don't have this book today, uh, but they had it at that time. And so that is the rhetorical question, are they not written in the book of the words of Solomon? And they maintain that about Solomon. Now, perhaps we have it in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, and, and to know what is happening, we really need to appreciate that this, this short description of the life of Solomon end, uh, started very well, but ended poorly in that sense where he started to compromise to allow for the, the worship of other gods for his wife's sake. Now, finally, in the last two verses, so the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel, remember all Israel is the 12 tribes, was 40 years. Same reign as David, and we pay attention to the last verse. And then Solomon laid down with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father David, and his son Rehoboam reigned in his place. Now we need to break this down a little bit. These expressions lay down with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father David, is an A and a B. Lay down with his fathers is a very noble term, noble expression. That he died naturally. He was not killed. Now, if he was killed, then we use the word mot or die. And so lay down with his fathers is a noble expression to join his fathers, wherever they may be. And this would be in a place called Sheol. That's the idea that the Hebrews would have. Now, whether this looks at a very vivid, candid expression that he would be laid in the physical tomb uh, of David, while well, he was buried together with his father in the city of David. And we haven't found this tomb before. And so I think there's a lot in the, uh, the archaeological digs in the city of David. So this is where Solomon was buried. And his son, 
took after him. And this means his dynasty persisted. Who did not have his dynasty persist? Saul. And because of that, God appointed David. And David had Solomon. And Solomon had Rehoboam. And the southern kingdom of Judah had the dynasty continued. However, in the northern kingdom of Ephraim or Israel, their dynasty did not continue the same way because uh, Jeroboam did not obey God. Now with this as a very lengthy chapter 11 of 1 Kings gives us a very important element that God is very strict with the, the tribe of Judah, particularly with Solomon. Now, I want to just mention this in closing, that God is very fair, very just in his dealings with his people, especially with the kings. When God looks at the person, and if that person has a lot of personal interaction with God, for example, like Moses, uh, God will not tolerate any, uh, any non-compliance because Moses had seen God. He had been party to doing the miracles. When it came to David, David had the experiences with God and he was anointed by God. He was given great strength and great valor to fight Goliath. And he did what God told him to do, man after God's own decisions, his own heart. When it came to Solomon, Solomon had two encounters with God at the beginning and towards the end uh, of the construction. And he, he actually displayed the wisdom that God had given him. But towards the end of his life, he wasn't so bright anymore. I guess senior moments may have overtaken him and he thought he could push back from the women that he had, but he didn't. And now we come to this part that God executed immediate judgment upon what Solomon did. Why was God just? Because Solomon had personal encounters with God. And when God asked him, what do you want? And he said, I want wisdom to rule over your people. And God was very happy with that. And so he had done a lot of wise acts. And yet his one act of disobedience, God had taken over the northern kingdom and passed it to Jeroboam in the act of Ahiah, grabbing his coat, carrying it into 12 pieces, putting 10 into the hands of uh, Jeroboam. Now, all these are foretelling what is going to happen in the future. When Solomon dies, when Rehoboam comes and takes over the throne, God's judgment upon Judah will take place. And so God is just. And when people have seen God or has encounters with God, God is extremely, extremely severe. But when one has not, then one will enjoy a little bit more patience and justice from God. Now with this, we come to the end of our session today.